Well, thanks so much to everybody for joining. Um, and it's really lovely to see all your faces. Um, I would love just to hear, uh, because I think these conversations that we've been having um, are so much impacted by where we are all coming from, uh, countries of citizenship, countries of residence, whatnot. And so I would love just to, for folks to type in the chat as to um, where you are, where you were uh, born and where you're currently re residing, just so we, we uh, get a sense of the room. I am Taiwanese Canadian. I currently live in the US um, and I am currently, uh, due to a strange mix of pandemic cir circumstances, including relating to the current US president's uh, schoolyard politics um, based in, or speaking to you from, from Mexico. And let me start sharing my screen. Um, Can, can you all see my screen? Perfect, great. Yes, we can. Wonderful. Yeah, so it's really exciting and strange to be um, speaking to you here today because, um, you know, on the topic of active and just democracies, as someone who is based in the US, um, I'm not sure how much uh, the news in the US is making it over to um, where, where you all are right now, but it's a big year for us. <laughs> Um, democracy has been under constant daily attack from voter suppression via the Postal Service to politicizing the Supreme Court to the head of state dodging his uh, fair share of contributing to the collective pot. And so it has been a really exhausting year. Um, and what I want to speak to you, to, uh, 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 what, what I want to talk about today is not necessarily big D democracy, but actually small D democracy. Um, and how, what we can learn from different community groups, um, different actors that are trying to and doing amazing work in advancing the just democracies that we all seek and what we as governments and allies can do to be able to learn from their efforts and to be able to incorporate them into our work. So what I wanna do is to sh first of all, start sharing a set of observations from the US um, then expand out a little bit to talk about what this means for our collective work and efforts. Um, and then from there, invite a fair bit of uh, dialogue and discussion around um, just your own experiences and questions and observations and whatnot. So these are the headlines right now in America. Uh, the election is, I believe, 35 days away. And, um, and I want to take us back first to four years ago when we knew it was going to be getting bad, um, but we didn't necessarily perhaps know quite how bad uh, four years on. This is an image from uh, four years ago, 2016, right after the US election, when a racist, misogynistic, ableist, and generally hateful man was elected to the White House. And there were a slew of hate crimes that erupted across the US. And so American residents and citizens started rallying around this theme of love. Love must trump hate. And empathy became a key word in America. We must mega, um, so to speak. We must make empathy great again. And we must cross these divides of misunderstanding, of mistrust, and, um, and empathy continues to be, I think, an important word that comes up in public innovation circles. I was speaking with a government innovation lab yesterday who asked me to um, talk with their, with their network of folks, of partners around how to build greater empathy. Um, we were talking about it four years ago as we are now, but I guess a question that has been coming up for me is how far has it actually gotten us? Um, in this, I've been really influenced um, by my own training um, as an ethnographer, as an organizer, as a designer, where a lot of my professional training is actually about surfacing stories from communities, pushing them to people of power and, um, and trying to build greater empathy so that you know, institutions just do the right thing. But last year, I heard a talk from an amazing um, writer and art historian, Aruna D'Souza, 
who gave a talk um, basically called Fuck Empathy. And she had this to say. She, 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 she stood on stage and said, I don't want to wait for people to develop empathy for me until I am treated as a full human being. Because a politics based on empathy imagines justice as something to be bestowed by newly enlightened individuals on other lesser individuals and communities. A politics of empathy allows those called upon to be empathetic, to remain in a position of su su supremacy, doling out justice as a matter of kindness. And as we have seen, the federal government hasn't developed empathy for the communities in the US that have been historically and violently oppressed in that it continues to disenfranchise and to suppress these communities and populations. And so waiting for empathy from institutional powers, from one's own government, seems to me to be an increasingly futile task as many around the world are realizing. And it's led to um, many conversations that I've, I, I've had with activists, community researchers, perhaps not stated so directly, um, but around the question around, what is a government? This is from Ori Akolo, who many may know, uh, a notable Kenyan activist and now philanthropist. And this is from March, but I, but, but I hear this question a lot um, because the huge differences in government responses to COVID, for example, federal and local have been especially notable and acute this year. And I think the responses that Ori got are worth reading and reflecting upon. Organized violence, crime, a species of the leech variety, the strongest, most organized gang in a territory, whomever you're paying a tax, a duty or a license to just to be. And I think some have been asking this question, do we even need one? And it's certainly not just in Kenya. Um, I think we've been I think many in the US are familiar with this quote from former President Ronald Reagan. The most terrifying words in the English language are, I am from the government and I am here to help. Now, for those of us that work in the public sector, this is obviously not very encouraging news. Um, it's actually a little bit depressing, but it is the reality that we are facing here in the US. And in fact, it is this distinct lack of empathy for our humanity um, and many communities disillusionment with government that led tens of thousands of protesters and their supporters to join the Black Trans Lives Matter protests in Brooklyn a few months back. Demanding basic dignity and respect for Black trans folks. It's what has made activists tired of asking for monuments that are affronts to their basic humanity to be torn down and to rise up in power at tackling the injustices and the monuments of injustice that they see around them. Because this too is democracy, beyond elections, beyond rhetoric, beyond analysis, but towards action. And so I know many working in government, around government, sort of with big institutions are actually quite scared of this. Um, we are scared of activists. We are cautious around civil society. We are nervous around media. Um, they're here to tell us what we are doing wrong. But I think also in my conversations with um, government allies around the world, we also know that in our hearts, we actually deeply agree with their values and what they're saying. And so there's a question of what to do. And so I wanna share another story of activism and of community organizing to show why it is absolutely essential that we work with them, not around them, not against them to realize the worlds that we seek. Um, and so for a glimpse of this, I wanna take you now to my home. I live in the central Brooklyn neighborhood of Bed-Stuy. And you may know it um, because it has been home to famous musicians such as the Notorious B.I.G. and Jay-Z. Uh, it is known for brilliant, beautiful block parties all summer long, though, of course, this is from a prior year. 
Um, and it's just a vibrant, culturally rich, um, historically rich neighborhood that is also uh, about 50% African American. And so what this meant in the early days of COVID is that my neighborhood was pr hit pretty hard. Due to the racial profile of the neighborhood, there were significant numbers of cases, there was rapidly growing unemployment, and there was severe food insecurity. It was actually a really bleak picture. And so in this time, government response was hugely lacking. Uh, some folks may have seen the federal government's response in the US was literally uh, mind boggling. States were competing with one another to bid for PPEs. Um, local governments didn't necessarily have the resources or the timeliness of response. And so people took matters into their own hands. And a, and a writer, that's my neighbor, um, started a mutual aid group called Bedsty Strong which was basically neighbors helping neighbors to just get by and to get what they need. And this was the website that was thrown up about two weeks after the pandemic first started. And within about a two, three week period, you had about 2000 people signed up. Today, I am one amongst now about 5,000 volunteers. Um, and as someone who has worked in the public and social sectors, and was actually fundraising for some essential private foundations in this time, I was absolutely floored by what I saw. Just to give you a sense of this, uh, this is the back end of bed -Sty Strong. This is our uh, ticket management system. So neighbors call a Google voice number, they leave a message and one of the volunteers, including myself, call them back to say, to ask for what they might need. Um, this was, again, set, set, set up about two weeks after the pandemic started. And early on, a lot of what folks needed was just food. Um, again, high unemployment, a lot of food insecurity. And so neighbors were just taking care of one another. We were calling back mostly elderly folks, um, many immunocompromised folks that were nervous to, to go outside and just doing grocery shopping for them and buying groceries and delivering that to, 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 to their door. And as someone who's worked on a lot of, lot of government programs and social programs, I was absolutely shocked by how we were operating. And to be honest, in the early days, a little bit snotty about it. Um, you know, you can see the types of things we were, we were delivering, um, you know, honey buns, bologna, we were asking people specifically what they needed and could we do more? And as someone whose training is to consider value for money, um, operational efficiency. Uh, this was this was really strange to me to, to 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 actually ask people for what they needed, to actually go out of our way to go to the bakery they wanted or the butcher they wanted. Um, this is a this is a totally foreign concept to me, and yet it felt amazing. Food is political. It felt amazing to be able to deliver to people what they needed, whereas many of the food banks and a lot of the local pantries were simply uh, doling out, you know, white bread, but, you know, basic, basic necessities. Um, and so what has happened over the past few months is there's now, I think this number is higher now, there's about sort of 5,000 me members um, using our work group on Slack. The group has raised about half a million dollars for the community fund from over 1,000 individuals and redistributed this to, you know, in, in the forms of groceries and essential supplies to about 10% of the neighborhood, totaling about a quarter of a million meals. And we are serving the most vulnerable, the elderly, the low income and the, and the, and the immunocompromised. And this has been a stark contrast to my day job because all of this is nights and weekends work and there's um, tons of amazing volunteers investing so much more than um, I have or could. Because in my day job, my nine to five, um, or I guess lately it's been more an eight to eight, I've been working with governments and international organizations um, around the world. And there've been fantastic responses, um, but there've also been some really bungled ones. And what we've seen amongst the highest levels of government are some of these factors, certainly in the US, uh, certainly with some other governments I've been speaking with, denial, blame, 
corruption of resources um, from benign incompetence to use of executive force to crack down on dissenters. And how this funnels down then into civil service is it really handicaps us. I think what I've really seen over the last year is that existing fragilities have been exacerbated. Internal politics have deepened, uh, have deepened and I think been very distressing for many of our allies and partners. And there's then an even greater mistrust of outsiders and of amateur change makers like these community groups um, and an, a willingness to open up and collaborate because we're nervous. We're nervous that people are going to see how much it is that we don't know. People are going to see that we don't have it all figured out. And so we keep our plans close. Um, but here's the thing, mistrust goes both ways and it works as a self-reinforcing loop. If we don't let our community partners in, if we're not going to open up to the activists, um, they're not gonna trust us either. And so the more that we mistrust our people, the more they're going to mistrust us. And I think what I've seen in the US certainly is a real clash between what um, Jeremy, he uh, Jeremy Hyman's and Henry Tim's called old power values. So embodied by governments and big institutions and new power values embraced by self-organizing, agile, responsive community groups. Uh, the way bureaucracies and institutions organize themselves um, is quite top down and control. Um, and, you know, you know I, sorry, folks, could, um, and so, I, and I think there are community groups that are looking uh, very much in the spirit of DIY culture in terms of radical open source collaboration, um, very, very different um, And, sorry, I mute, so we, um, and so thank you. And as a trained ethnographer of both communities and of institutions, I was really having a difficult reconciling with uh, my day job, with my community and volunteer work. And so I tried to write it down for myself. Why was it that I was feeling very actually disengaged in my job, um, feeling quite distraught? feeling um, like I just wanted to spend all my time doing community work. And so this was a table that I put together to try and make, th make sense of things for myself. Um, I saw that in the community work, the questions people were asking were just what needs to be done right now and how can we do our very best to make that happen? Whereas within government, we were asking ourselves, what is the right approach? We were investing in rapid, but still, you know, uh, assessments that took a fair amount of time, trying to set up our baselines, trying to do the long-term planning, figure out the strategic framework. Um, you know, in the community work, we saw that we believed that the answers were going to come from one another, to come from our neighbors, to come from get, getting together and, and, uh, and uh, figuring out how to actually make change happen one completed action at a time. And on the institutional side in my day job, you know, I just felt we were spending a lot of time on Zoom call after Zoom call after Zoom call. And they were all rather in, it, it, sorry, inconclusive and just taking a long time to get anywhere. Um, and so as the planning calls, as the briefing, as the data models and the papers started piling up, I saw a lot of energy spent on just developing this analysis as there were essential needs being met and businesses saved and livelihood stabilized on the community side. And so you can see these different types of responses. And I'm not saying there's a right and a wrong because institutions have checks and balances and norms and processes and mechanisms in place that don't allow them to work as the ways that communities do. But in this table um, and having written this down for myself, I think I understood why people were asking the question that Ori asked, what is a government? When I would bring up in these groups, hey, you know, we're having a difficult time fundraising. Maybe we should actually reach out to private foundations or to governments because they're providing support. I got a big fat rejection. You know, people were so um, scared, uh, almost allergic 
to this term government because we didn't want government coming in and messing up what we had created. We didn't want them to come in and corrupt what we had done. And I think this also is a really, um, to me, a very sad dynamic. Um, but I do think there are lessons that we can take from this. I think that our fear of opening up our fear of working with amateurs, our fear of working with activists in civil society. Um, it, I believe this needs to change. We need to be able to harness their energy to be able to respond with agility, with creativity, and to reimagine our future. Because bed Stuy Strong and other community organizing efforts, they're not grounded in a politics of empathy. They're not grounded in a politics of asking for those with power to dole out kindness, to dole out resources to those with less power and resources. It asks that we all work together. And so it's not a politics of empathy, it's a politics of solidarity. It is a politics of collective liberation because we're all good at different things. And so let's remember that and think about how we bring that to bear in creating the world that we want. And so the implications, um, you know, I've been in touch with um, and advised countless working groups and commissions and task forces and whatnot. And a lot of the questions have been around, okay, what do we need to do differently? You know, what are the, you know, five action steps that we can take? Uh, what are the reforms? But, um, and to the question from S S Simone, what do we mean by amateurist? Everyone has values, absolutely. Um, I very much believe that. But I think many of the institutions that I work with certainly say, well, you know, the amateur efforts, they're not, or no, the, the community efforts, which are sort of described as amateur are not seen to have equal value. Uh, say the government efforts, they have fewer resources, they're more disorganized, they don't have, um, you know, data and analytics that we can understand and indicators that we can track. And so they're not seen as sufficiently legitimate for us to partner with. And I believe that is wrong. Um, but many of these task forces and working groups were asking for reform. We're asking, what do we need to do to reform? And more and more, I've been convinced that reform is not enough. Um, civil rights legend, uh, Angela Davis has often said that the problem with reform is that reform actually renders the institutions themselves more permanent. And so I actually think we need to broaden our imagination. I think we need to do more than reform. And I think we need stronger co-creation and collaboration between all different actors within society um, to bring about systems change. Because the problems are too big and too wicked and too messy for each of us to figure out how to resolve them. And so we require, um, and so we require all of us. We need the radical imagination of our artists. We need the moral courage of our activists. We need the rigor of our researchers and the scale of um, uh, resources and distribution networks and, um, and uh, of our of our private sector and our and our public sector. And I think that we need to bring all actors to bear in solving the problems of the future. But these roles right here, these roles as commonly understood, are also just too simplistic and they're even naive. Um, I think this is the stereotype that we have of activists, that we have of our artists, that we have of governments. And we actually need to evolve our roles. We need to broaden our own understanding of what it is that we bring to bear on these questions of democracy and justice. And we need to do more than what our stereotypical archetypal roles are. And so perhaps to protest is not enough. Um, activists would actually get their hands dirty and help defining more concrete paths to dismantling the injustices that we see. For governments, it's not just enough to say, you know, we're just going to create policies and deliver services to help our people. We actually have to protect against corrupting interests. And for journalists now, gosh, for the media, you know, the role of the fourth estate is to monitor institutions and violations of our social contract. But media models now also incentivize divisiveness, they incentivize hate. And so we have to figure out how to combat these narratives that fuel 
fear and hate um, so that we can uh, better understand one another um, and be able to have more nuanced public dialogue. And when I talk to people about this framework, I think I hear a lot of, gosh, it's really hard, you know? How, how will we actually bring the right actors to the table? How do we overcome the mistrust and the shame and the inertia and the fear that we're all feeling? How might we agree to a common vision when we all come from such different perspectives? And how do we sustain this momentum into the long haul to not just work on a project or an, an initiative, um, but to work on a big structural change? And these are very good questions. Um, I work through these in many of the efforts and initiatives um, that I'm involved in, but it's really difficult, but it's not a reason to then not do it. And it's really essential that we all actually all come together and figure out how we use our superpowers to solve the pressing, wicked, embedded challenges of our world. Um, because these superpowers at the bottom, no one set of actors can do all these things. You know, we know that within government, we are actually really limited and we are actually really constrained in what we are able to do. We can't necessarily think out of the box um, in a way that artists can and can reframe our world the way that artists and poets help us to do. We are not able to call out um, in as uh, strong a way um, of the injustices that we see because you know many of this uh, is related to institutional politics within our own organization. So we can't do it in a way that activists can. We don't necessarily have the resources that academia might to be able to then assess the paths forward. Um, and we're not able to be as agile or creative as grassroots groups can. Um, and I think that, um, Johanna, you asked about um, ordinary citizens that fall into none of these mentioned categories. Um, I also think, I mean, I don't, I don't believe anyone's an ordinary citizen. I think that um, this year certainly in the US has, I think, uh, mobilized and politicized and sort of brought into action a lot of folks. Um, and I see many people fall across these different categories. Um, they work in companies, um, you know, they, they work in their communities. Um, and so I, I, I guess I see a lot of um, citizens shaping these um, or, or shaping or being a, a, a part of these different categories. Um, and so this is what I hope we are able to do. Um, and you know, in terms of the mistrust and the fear that we see, you know, people balk at the fact that we would open up to citizens and communities and get them to co-create our future with us. But um, I'm really inspired by the words of Adrian Marie Brown, trust the people, trust your people, and they become trustworthy. Seven months ago, if you asked me if bed strong would be something that I could have even imagined into being, I would have laughed. Uh, because also, frankly, within that group, there are many folks that we in the public sector cannot hire or afford to hire. And that's a whole other set of problems around why we can't um, bring in top uh, engineering talent. But anyway, um, you know, and so as mutual aid networks show, this trust, uh, this mistrust is misguided. And I think we need to overcome this because I think this is not a, a utopian vision of the future that I'm advocating for. Um, structures that enable and sustain injustice were intentionally designed and futures and democracies that honor and protect justice, equality and liberation can also be designed. But I really believe that it requires all of us, but not all of us at the same time. You know, co-creation is often misunderstood as put a bunch of people in, in, into a, a room together and magic will happen. And I don't think that's the case because as we've discussed, there's different superpowers that we all bring. And I think they're the sequencing and the structuring of how we have these conversations is, are, is, is really, really important. So in terms of imagining what our future should look like, what our world should look like, I personally want artists and activists to be leading those conversations because they can bring the radical imaginations and the moral courage that many others of us working in different roles cannot. Um, and then in terms of what are the paths to actually realizing this future, there is so much that we can already draw on in terms of grassroots and community groups that are doing amazing work. 
And then we can bring our um, academia and researchers to bear in terms of analyzing, okay, what are the legislative, operational, administrative paths to actually make that happen? And then from there, you know, I think it's the role of uh, the private sector and of governments to line up behind these visions, to use their production and distribution capacities, to use their, um, the reach and durability of our public institutions to make this happen. Um, because right now, you know, it's happening actually in the inverse way. We're having governments and companies that are very close to governments setting these agendas um, and then many of us, communities, citizens, activists are protesting on the fringes for then incremental reforms on top of that. And I, I believe it's time for that to change. Um, and so, you know, these are just some of my reflections around how we can create the just and active big D and small D democracies that we seek. Um, and I would love to hear any reflections, reactions, feedback, from your own work um, and move into a discussion. So thank you so much. Um, and if folks uh, want to turn on their video, I think it'd be nice to be able to see folks, um, but also no pressure. How do you, so there's a, um, I know there's a lot of experts in the room, so I certainly don't want to dominate the Q and A in the discussion. Um, but um, you know, perhaps I can I can kick it off with a question from Andrea. How do you co-create democracy with everyone in a representative democratic system? Time for participatory democracy. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think that um, many of the, you know. This is actually a conversation I, I've been having a lot. Um, I, I do a lot of work on uh, participatory democracy, um, you know, from sort of participatory budgeting to, you know, thinking work on citizens assemblies to um, sort of various other forms. Uh, and I think at least in the conversations that I've been in, uh, some of the more radical camps, I think, of the future of democracy folks um, and communities that I'm part of are starting to question, uh, do we actually need electoral representative democracy? And I think, you know, a year ago, two years ago, I would have, uh, for me personally, I would have said, no, you know, I believe democratic innovations are actually a, a complement to, uh, to elections and to electoral democracies. I don't know. I'd be, I'd be curious for um, perspectives in the room because I think we see so much of the corrupting influence of um, elections. Uh, we see sort of how much uh, the process is captured by those that have the resources and the ability and the um, birthright uh, uh, to run. I know this is not sort of the case everywhere, but um, you know, more and more as folks are advocating for a mix of uh, yes, randomly selected representatives and government whatnot um, as a path to having a more diversity of perspectives and profiles and demographics and psychographics that represent us. I'm increasingly convinced by that, um, but I would be curious if others have thoughts as well. I'd like to put in a word here. Please. Uh, from uh, Finland, actually. So listening to you, of course, I realized that there is a there is much more than just a notion of what uh, between us and, for instance, U.S. experience. Uh, my professional experience is simply one that I have all my professional life been some kind of, uh, call it bureaucrat, call it administrator. Uh, and this question about the need for democratic, for representative organizations, actually, uh, I have... I feel that it is, the need is actually very strong simply because citizens, even if these organizations are not necessarily totally effective, citizens do need a continuous system where they know that on given conditions in given stages, they have a way of looking at the totality of the way society runs. Uh, it's, but the point is, of course, what do we need for this representative system in today's world 
to actually work with the citizens. And that's, of course, uh, indeed what you are talking about also, I think, very much. And, and the interesting thing is that for some part of society, that is to say the ones I would call big natives, uh, this is happening. Because so very much of the things that we are doing, say, for instance, I'm not talking about the uh, thing that we'll have in Helsinki next tomorrow about town planning in our area and so on. We actually have direct contact with the people doing the things and the people deciding the things on the net. And then, of course, we come to the simple point. I'm 71 myself. Uh, there is a very significant portion of society which is not on the net. And in Finland, we see, for instance, in the local association where I'm working, we see that there is a very great danger of dropping off a lot of people who really would need to be heard. And those are naturally not the strongest, the most self-sufficient people. Those are the people that may be most in trouble. So it's complicated. Right. No, thank you for sharing that experience. Um... If anyone wants to jump in with a comment, please feel free. Um, I think you know early on I was, um, and it's interesting seeing where everyone is coming from in the in the chat. Um, I think that many of these conversations, I know, I think it's mostly folks from Europe on the call. I I, I understand the American experience uh, feels quite different. Um, as someone who's not American, being in that country right now it feels like I'm watching a bit of a horror show sometimes. <laughs> um, but. At the same time, um, you know, uh, just in the past few weeks, I was in Denmark um, and I was in Germany and I, uh, you know, I was having conversations with folks just like we don't have those same problems of, you know, discrimination and of racism and yeah, of feels like much of institutions. And, um, you know, and, and, and at first I took some of these comments, um, I think more in uh, Denmark than in Germany um, at face value, but digging into some of the, um, digging into some of the questions or the problems that I was seeing um, certainly in Denmark around, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm not familiar with Danish politics intimately, um, but around some of the conversations right now around the construction of uh, ghettos, around how uh, Muslim populations are treated, around how some, um, uh, you know, um, violently racist acts um, have been treated. You know, these are these are things that I think are actually very universal conversations. They may not be as acute and extreme and as extreme as we are seeing in the U.S. Because, Lord, the U.S. is, <laughs> is a whole other um, set of uh, challenges or at a different intensity. But I, but I do think these these questions of unrepresentative institutions are a uh, are something that we see around the world, and I think um, you're. I think you're absolutely right. You know who is being represented because there are often the people that are uh, that have the most to lose that are living at the sort of more um, whose 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 livelihoods and dignity and well being are the most fragile that um, that we often overlook and that we don't see. So I very much appreciate that comment, um, and I think that. Ethnographers have done studies actually of participatory democracy exercises that show um, folks that uh, I think folks that have the least power when they show when they come and show up to try and participate, they actually get more and more disillusioned with government and with democracy and with institutions, because participating nowadays is a professional skill. You need to know how to speak in a soundbite. You need to know how to write on a post-it note. You need to know how to, you know, carry yourself, comport yourself and wear the right things and do the right. And I think it's just, um, I think it's really difficult for folks. And so, um, yeah, I, those are some of my reflections and I'd be curious for others. Um, yeah, maybe just to add on, on what you just said, this is where my, my question early on, on, on ordinary citizens came from, because as you just said, you know, if we look at those categories that you drew up and that I liked in a way, you know, being an artist is a profession, being a journalist is a profession, et cetera, et cetera. But then, you know, we, we might, yeah, lose out on the people that really do struggle, but they don't have time to go to, you know, to attend these formats, either because they're not on the net as the colleague from Finland reference to, or they, they're just not, they don't have time to go to a physical meeting somewhere because they have two jobs and not enough money and all of that. So, so yeah, um, I wonder, you know, how to, 
how to bridge that gap, you know, how to include these people um, in that framework. Um, any reflections from the group? I mean, I've been I've been really excited to see the um, I think what the OECD is calling the deliberative wave growing, um, and so sort of more and more um, deliberative me uh, mechanisms. I'm more familiar with citizens assemblies, but where we also um, you know select people, uh, provide them um, you know time off and compensation, and you know to be able to come and serve on juries as we do with for you know criminal cases or you know um, as for the big policy questions of our time. So. I'm, yeah, so, you know, that's not a great answer because that is still then a very sort of select group of citizens for very specific issues. Um, but I've been quite, um, quite intrigued by, uh, by the sort of growth there. Um, but I think I also, you know, to you and I think what Amanda here is saying, um, yeah, you know, the distinction of artists um, and bit, Basically, I, I think as I understand the question, you know, it, it, it may not be so helpful to distinguish people in their boxes as artists and researchers and policymakers and whatnot, because, and I, I agree, I think we all contain multitudes. I think we are all, uh, you know, a, a combination um, and a messy and beautiful combination of the set of experiences and perspectives and, you know, creative pursuits that we can all pursue. But I think that was an exercise to try and actually put some labels and boxes on things because, as we know, in the institutions that we work in, um, we all like frameworks. We all, um, as we need to sort of scale things, we need to be able to, um, to, uh, to, uh, yeah, just have common frameworks and language and understanding to be able to, um, to, uh, you know, pull initiatives forward. But I absolutely agree. Um, I also think that you know, um, art and imagination is something that. Um, I don't think we've done a good job of democratizing. You know, our world is very exclusive. Um, we believe that certain people's voices and imaginations matter and others don't. Um, and so it makes, I think, many um, nervous about sort of, you know, imagining bigger uh, for fear of being, of fear of being ridiculed. Um, Jeff Mulgan has a paper out now on the crisis of civic imagination um, published with Demos Helsinki. Um, talking that, you know, we, we're having a difficult time imagining what positive futures to our current just daily compounding crises are. Um, and I think that is, I think that's, um, I think that's really true. And I think that's really acute. Um, so how do we actually unlock the imaginations of all actors within society is certainly a question that I've been playing with um, and trying to, um, yeah, spin up and work through more partnerships with um, uh, artists like in museums and galleries type artists, but also artists, um, just community artists, cultural institutions, uh, community theater groups in different ways, because I think those are, can also be a, um, in an inviting and an accessible way of bringing people into the conversation that don't feel like they can go to um, a city council meeting, that never get invited to um, to uh, you know government consultations or working groups or task forces, but then it's on us to go listen to what they're saying and to really really listen um, to what they're saying in these other fora. So, um, point. It's all on the neck of the activists, because who else is there to seek out these people? And that's a problem, actually, because, I mean, again, I talk about my, our local association. We are not so very many people active. We have 200 members, so there is four when we meet, uh, and three being actually the dues, the rest don't. But we see it as absolutely necessary for us to reach all those people that cannot, so to say, by themselves catch or grab communications. But it's it's not really easy. And especially, of course, if you are an old person, really you don't have your own kids and so on. We're talking about sandbox meetings. We think about if the younger members who have kids would talk about visions, ideas, and projects with the people sitting on the sandbox edge. 
um, perhaps we could succeed with that. But of course, the uh, pandemic has put a stop to that. We can't send people just out there sitting on a sandbox edge and keeping two meters distance. It's not practical with kids. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Any any responses? Anyone like to jump in on that? I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know that it's, um, I don't know that it's all on the weight of, uh, I think our activists do a lot. Um, I think they are under-resourced. I think they do a lot and, 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 and you're right, but you know, there is a lot of weight on them to be able to push farther and more that, um, that we are, uh, farther and more that we, you know, within institutions are able to, to push for. Um, but then it's, but I also think um, with all due respect to my activist friends and communities, I think the way that activism and these conversations play out right now is also not particularly productive. Um, or I think we are in an era of where um, a lot of the most creative organizing and activism happens through yelling at each other um, in the media and on social media. Um, and that doesn't make people want to come to the table and negotiate. Because then in that way, when, um, when you know, governments are coming to the table and it feels like, and there's so much media attention and scrutiny already on you, you feel like what, whatever you're doing is a compromise. Um, it is a concession. And I don't believe that's the best way to get the structural change that we need at the same time. Certainly in the US, people have said, you know, we've been asking nicely, asking nicely, asking nicely for so long. We are sick and tired of it. And so, I don't know, I'm trained as an ethnographer. So I like see everyone's side and I get it. And you're a human and you're a human. We're all just humans. And why can't we get along? <laughs> um, but, I, but I very much... Um, uh, understand that perspective. Um, uh, Simone, did you want to yeah. share something? Hi, I'm Simone from the Netherlands. Um, I think we have global problems in the world. And we, ca we can, um, I agree with you that we can imagine a better world of, 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 for us all. But you have to be creative. Do you mean people have to be more creative about solutions? And uh, if we're looking our ways of li living now, I think we transitions to from world A to world B. So imagination is very important to imagine a better world for us all. And it's not um, only spiritual, but it's also um, believing that we do that as global conscious leaders. And I'm a strong motivator of conscious leadership. And I'm doing programs in the Netherlands for that, uh, in South, and also in Europe, in South Italy. Um, and I think we can do it everywhere. And, it's, and, and, and if we believe that in this whole world where there are so many people... Um, and creativity, I uh, was respond on that. I think it's very good that you describe it in your framework. Because uh, creativity and culture, um, consultations, um, it's not anymore there. And I'm very um, yeah, curious about this whole meeting. What do you think about that? How we can co-create more creativity in the world? That's a question for you. <laughs> Oh man, it's a, it's a, <laughs> um, I don't know. I think that um, I think I work with a lot of communities that are basically just struggling to meet their basic needs, um, and so and actually are really really creative, are really really creative in how they do that. Um, I think we sometimes uh, I think when people are struggling to make ends meet and have a few different jobs and are you know I think. We then use the term. Well, they're a they're a they're a hustler, you know. We use that pejoratively in a negative sense. Um, whereas people are just finding creative ways to have their basic economic need, needs met. Um, but I think it's not perhaps the big C creativity that we think. Um, but uh, you know, um, Alexa Clay of the RSA US. Um, she's written a great book about the misfit economy around how just um, uh, you know there's creative entrepreneurs all around, and I think. 
they're not necessarily the creativity that we all see, but I think I see so much um, ingenuity um, now, but then I think there's a disconnect in how we then bring that into our governance institutions um, to bear and how we listen and understand that. Um, but that's a little bit what I see. Um, and I also, I'm, I'm so glad you, you, you sort of talked about spiritual leadership um, and about sort of, you know, because I think so much of this work is actually really intimately personal. I think that many of us that work in these spaces, um, you know, I think the nonprofit space, um, certainly in the US, and that's another conversation that we can talk about with Andrea's question. Um, it's mm -hmm. dominated by people with privilege. It's dominated by people that can afford to take lower salaries um, to be able to, you know, kind of uh, pursue these, um, these grand ambitions because they're not struggling to put food on the table. And so when we talk about um, shifting power, when we talk about um, supporting marginalized communities, um, I think what we're also talking about is giving up some of our own power, mm -hmm. our decision-making authority, the thought that we have the right answer. And I think while many of us agree with this in principle, it's actually very hard to do in practice, to step back and say, I don't believe that I have the answer or this is gonna be a slower process because many communities that we're working with haven't had the chance and the opportunities to have these, you know, whatever Malcolm Gladwell's thing is, like 100,000 hours of practice in doing this, right? Um, and I think that's really hard. Um, I was having a conversation with folks from, um, uh, from m from around the world, but I think many um, from Finland um, at the recent Untitled Festival. And it was a conversation about privilege and about power and about what it means to reckon with your own privilege and reckon um, with what it means to give up power. And I think that um, it was a heavily sort of Finnish group. And I think many folks were having a difficult time, um, you know, wrestling with what that meant. Um, and so we asked some questions, you know, class privilege. Um, uh, do you agree with the statement that every time you have had to move from your home, it has been voluntary and you have had another home to move to? Do you have the resources to be able to buy new clothing um, whenever you would like to, to keep up with trends, um, changes in seasons and trends? Um, you know, all these questions, we, we sort of went through like 50 of them um, to, to talk about, um, you know, what privilege actually means and all the invisible ways that I think it sort of plays out. Um, and I think once you realize that and reckon with that, because I had a lot of Finns being like, well, I didn't ask for privilege. I didn't ask for this power. I didn't ask to be born in the society. But you know what? Many of us sitting here, we all, we all won the lottery of birth um, by being able to sit where we are. And so how do we reckon with that um, in a deeply sort of personal way um, and many sometimes spiritual energetic, however you wanna call it and bring those into our practices as policy practitioners, as researchers, um, as whatnot. And this is something I think a lot about and I think many, much of the work in the somatic healing embodied justice movements are really, really important for people in our space to be grappling with um, because many of the communities that we're working with are really traumatized. <laughs> They've been traumatized for generations and there's more and more research about epigenetics and how that passes down. Um, and so I think we need to really reckon with and understand that. Um, uh, Simone, did you want to say something? Yes. Are you familiar with uh, Terry Yu? Pardon me? Do you know Terry Yu? No, no, I don't. No, because uh, um, that's a, um, a transition from uh, plan E to plan B. And uh, it's a spiritual uh, way to uh, have action in the traumatizing, like social actors and uh, activation within your body to go to the na uh, another level. And I think it's very important that we um, recognize that. And it's, it's all also about, uh, I'm also a sense maker, and what I mean by sense making is that for every people in the world, rich or poor, it's very important that we recognize ourselves as human beings from na nature human beings. So we are independent from nature, and I think we have to recognize that as a whole. So 
and we can do expl uh, explor explanations or explore things in a new in a lab or new ways of thinking. And it's I think it's privileged to think like this, but it's for everyone important that we um, explore new ideas. So yeah. for rich and poor and different kind of groups. So maybe we can work together as a whole, I don't know, but I think we have to move on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. Um, I'll just respond to the final question um, from um, Andrea, and then I think we might be at time, um, but I invite any comments to any of that. We're jumping around a bit, but um, does the existing government in the US can engage with community action? Um, I think it's, uh, and are we filling in holes where government cannot act? This is the case of many social enterprises everywhere. Um, yeah, absolutely. So. Uh, in the U.S., I work with a few different governments, mostly at the local level. Um, so we do a lot of work with New York City, uh, where I'm based. Um, and I think there's absolutely, and then I do work with a lot of international institutions. Um, there's certainly acknowledgement. I think when we've talked about support, um, and I think part of the reason I've been trying to sort of, you know, get this idea that we really need to learn from and work with one another and use each other's superpowers is because I don't think there's enough support. Um, because what usually happens is, well, our legal frameworks, our partnership frameworks, you know, make it really difficult um, for this collaboration to happen. Um, and I think also we're nervous about opening up um, because right now, as you see here with my mutual aid group, this is doing the work that um, I think many folks rightly feel that government should be doing. We've all paid our taxes, certainly more taxes than the president has paid, uh, $750. Man, seven hundred fifty dollars! Wow. Okay, um, but um, but um, you know the government is not, and, and and that's why I think in these conversations when I say, hey, we should collaborate with government, people are like, hell no, I don't want to do that. Um, the government is corrupt. The government is going to be corrupting, and I think that we know that government is not a monolith, but I think the media narratives that we have paint government as such, and there's so much mistrust. Um, and so what's led to a really sad situation, um, I, was, I was born yeah, in Taiwan. Um, and, the, and the response in Taiwan. Uh, yeah, hi, Robin. Oh, uh, the response in Taiwan has been- uh, The Panthea Lee thing. Hi, Charles, we can hear you. Oh yeah, okay. Hello. Um, hi. Hi. Um, and I think, I think we're wrapping up in a, in a two, two two minutes. Um, but anyway, um, the response in Taiwan has been amazing. And we, you know, there, there, there's not enough time to talk about that. Um, um, that was very excited that the Czech government uh, delegation recognized us recently, because there's only 15 countries in the world that recognize Taiwan. But anyway, um, and so I think, you know, what's happening in the US now is we have shredded our social safety nets. Um, there's been so much just racism and discrimination that has been normalized. Um, and so we are leaving a lot of this work for vulnerable groups and for basic social support to be done by communities that already have very little. Many of the folks I work with have lost their jobs. They are struggling financially and, and economically, and yet they're still supporting their neighbors. Um, and the way that it's funded in the US is absolutely bananas. Um, it is funded by private foundations, um, you know, and I, 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 like I know this is the case elsewhere in the world, but I think the U.S. provides particular sort of tax incentives and support to um, basically billionaires that don't pay, pay their fair share of taxes that actually sort of, you know, just jump over um, a lot of the, um, uh, you know, democratic norms and, you know, just citizenship norms that we all um, uh, subscribe to, jump over this um, subvert our democracies and then actually, you know, get to pick and choose and cherry pick um, which of their sort of activist community efforts and whatnot um, they should support. It's, it's, it's crazy. Um, and so I think governments actually uh, right now um, benefit a lot from, or governments at the federal level, I think benefit a lot sort of from this current um, patchwork system. Um, and it's, uh, it's really, really sad. Um, there is some support. There obviously are great actors that are working together, um, but I think structurally, um, U.S. society is not set up that way. But I've been there 12 years, so what do I know? 
Um, anyway, I think we're at time. Um, thank you so much to everyone for staying the full hour um, and for listening to the conversation and contributing your insights and thoughts. Um, it's been really wonderful having a conversation with you all. So thanks so much. Um, and hopefully we'll meet again. <laughs>